And I think I think Got you it. should be able to share. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. If you go, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself now that we've got the recording going so that it'll yeah. go the record. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining. My name is Brenton Kelly um, from Quail Springs. I've uh, been in the Santa Barbara Goleta area since uh, the 1980s, early 80s. I came um, UCSB, graduated and went on. I worked um, a, a decade or so career working for the Ala Vista Recreation and Park District in, in their park management, organic park district there on the coast, an amazing public agency that's uh, never used Roundup. Um, and uh, then, then went on to uh, purchase um, a business from Phil Boise, the Island Seed and Feed Nursery out on Fairview in Goleta and uh, passionate um, sort of permaculture retail store, nursery, pet garden and farm supply, uh, least toxic pest controls and you know advocacy for backyard composting chickens and and um, closed systems. Um, so then uh, from Quail, from Island Seed and Feed, I, uh, I, I met Warren and Cindy and, and Paul and Comey, the founders of, um, of Quail Springs. Uh, they had, were working in Goleta with WIP, with the Wilderness Youth Project, a uh, uh, nature immersion, after school immersion um, youth project. Uh, and they, were, they had just closed escrow out here in the Cuyama on this 450 acre parcel for the purpose of being able to uh, have a destination, an educational um, instructive sort of venue where uh, the notion of a sustainable human settlement might be possible to conceive where, where you know, there wasn't an away, there wasn't a place that things could just get dumped or that the, you know, you know and we're not, we don't claim to be self-sufficient, but we, we do a, a lot of um, closed system design out here. So. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and start screen sharing a uh, a slide deck I have um, if I can. How's that? You guys seeing that? Yep. Yes. Great. Well, um, we are literally the, the the that view down the valley is 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 due west uh down the valley and those mountains are all in santa barbara county i'll uh the photograph was taken in ventura so we're like right a stone's throw across uh into into ventura but our our greater region is is that kuyama valley there um below and uh like i say we uh we are sort of tucked in this high desert region this is a a, a mural that quail springs had um uh we 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 got a grant from the water resource department to uh, for water education. This is behind the family resource center in Kuyama. And uh, just to sort of to let us know, uh, Quail Springs is up here in Venticopa. These are the Sierra Madre uh, mountains here. Maybe I can, whoops, uh, I might be able to get my uh, pointer to be a laser. No, anyway, the, the Sierra Madre coastal range, there's this is the uh, water cycle as viewed from the Kuyama. And we have, you know, evaporation coming from you guys on the coast and then precipitation coming out of the condor up here where it condenses over Mount Pinos. This is looking east up the uh, Kuyama Valley as if you're driving out of Santa Maria towards Bakersfield, which is over here on the left or back down to Ventura on the 33. Um, which is just now getting somewhat reopened after being closed for the last six months uh, due to slides. So, so Quail Springs is up against the mountain here, Mount Pinos, uh, which is an 8,000 foot island um, peak. It's, it's quite a, uh, a weather maker in itself. So uh, a bit of a rain shadow, as you can see here, the Sierra Madres rings out all the clouds and over here on the Caliente range, they get um, you know four to eight inches of rain a year. Um, we got 14 this year, so it was a, it was a wet one. Much of it comes mm. as snow and ice mm. in the winter. Um, we had a nine inch snowfall this winter, it was remarkable. Um, this was early on uh, after, uh, in, in about 2008. And uh, you can see right through here, this sort of straight line was a, uh, the previous owners of the land uh, 
had a light aircraft like a Piper Cub and they would fly in and land on here and there was an airplane hangar over here. And that was the development of the farm when we purchased it in 2004. And uh, since then in that airstrip of a zone, we've grown this uh, food forest um, that is all irrigated on surface water diversion. Now, Kuyama used to have a lot of surface water uh, running through the river. Um, very few of the farms uh, can can survive on surface water anymore, but we have a natural spring. Uh, I think uh, there's there's a there's a rainy day uh, when the when the water really does move through Kuyama. Um, high desert it may be, but when it does rain, uh, the landscape moves dramatically. Uh, that was an exciting um, about a four inch rain right there. Um, this is our spring. So there's a there's a natural seep uh, just into the national forest behind the farm, and we do a gravity feed irrigation system that uh, gets a surprising amount of water from a very small trickle. Um, and uh, I'll just say um, back in 1923, this parcel uh, was given the water rights to 10 acre feet a day. I'm sorry, 10 acre feet a year of diversion for the farm operation here. And uh, when, when I came in 2008, I kind of laughed at that and said, oh yeah, well, there's not that much run, water running through the, the creek at this point. And I uh, didn't really assume that we'd ever be able to get back to that. But in the last two to three years, we've been able to, in the recovery of the spring and the, the uh, sort of increased sponge of the wetlands, the water now is running much stronger and uh, more uh, diverse ecosystem up there. And we, in the last two years, have been diverting 10 acre feet a year. A pretty remarkable accomplishment considering what was here uh, about 12 years ago when we got here. Um, this is the way we planted the garden. My, my wife and I uh, were the farm uh, managers early on. This is a sort of a, um, a Middle Eastern approach of sunken garden beds as opposed to raised beds. Um, each one of these hay filled pits was about eight inches deep um, once it had already been filled with compost. So the plants are down in a pit in a moist and fertile uh, sort of pocket where the water and the nutrients stays. And then the footpath and the traffic is all kind of on raised paths between it. And then they're drip irrigated. In between these waffle beds were these long lines. This one you can just see here has a uh, irrigation system in it for trees. So each one of these waffles was about 100 square feet uh, of, of planting bed for, for uh, annual crop production. But in that row between beds, and you can see from here, we're, we're looking down on the farm from the top of the hill. There's these long contoured rows in which we planted perennial crops, trees support and, and uh, primary support trees that um, on the course of a few years produce the shade and wind block necessary for those waffle beds to become more productive. And uh, so this is like less than 10 years later, um, the trees now, uh, there's a, a variety of native cottonwoods and elderberries and also some pioneer species, some black locusts, honey locusts, and, um, and other poplars that uh, were quick growing and we're going in and sort of thinning them back out now that the canopy is, is filled in. Uh, we've got a little production greenhouse here for, for growing crops through the winter and uh, a couple of goat sheds. And we produce uh all of our leafy greens all our garlic and onions uh all of our milk eggs and meat uh we have a, a dairy herd of goats nubian goats and uh and a flock of chickens and those things um those particular products are not necessarily the easiest and most convenient thing to grow out here in the high desert but they are the most extractive uh financially and environmentally that the story of where your dozen eggs comes from is, um, is it's probably depicted in the cost you're willing to pay for them. 
Uh, when, when they get under $4 a dozen, there's an untold story of grief, uh, both in the land that those birds were raised and produced those eggs, but also in the, uh, in the birds themselves to save a few dollars on eggs. Um, we actually feel growing birds out here in the desert is, we, we don't really, uh, we, we look at it as a way of, of buying fertilizer. We buy good quality organic uh, poultry feed and we feed it to birds and they give us a marvelous turd that helps the garden um, flourish. And occasionally they lay a wonderful egg that helps us keep it out of uh, the aisles of Trader Joe's. Uh, milk equivalent, the uh, production of milk from dairy goats is stunning. We, we feed, um, we get about two gallons of milk a day producing our yogurt and cheese. And, uh, and then, you know, for every birth of, uh, of a doe coming into milk, uh, she usually births two kids and half of them are males and the males are really not very good at milking, but they produce a marvelous uh, goat sausage in the refrigerator. Um, and so there's a, there's a production of meat and, and uh, dairy from our, uh, from our goats. We've done rabbits. In fact, this is our right here in the center of the picture here. That's our, our rabbitry um, about a, the size of a two car garage. Um, with four working does and one buck, we produced 50 pounds of meat a month and and 10 pelts, um, and that and that <clears throat> that's at half half speed. That's half the um, the rate that their you know industrial standard of production. That's giving the does a, a month off between litters and and actually taking summers off and stuff. But truly a remarkable production in the high desert. That little canopy there had sort of underground burrows for the for the rabbits to mimic um, a native. Uh, all the rabbits out here uh, live underground, so we figured our rabbits should do the same. Um, and we also had ducks out here at one point, um, all sort of in the effort to reduce the uh, the demand on the most costly things that we would otherwise be pr purchasing for the for the farm and the programming. Uh, let's keep moving here. I know you guys have other things to do. This is the beginning uh, of those trees coming up in the uh, in the food forest. That's my wife, Jan, and we're giving a farm tour there to folks just sort of talking about the layout of the land. And here's a couple of years later. And and that's me getting the my hat knocked off by the branches. And uh, and uh, you can see the the beds of annual production in between these rows of uh, these are the native cottonwood trees that we uh, got from the from the spring. Uh, you can just see back here behind me is uh, one of our compost piles, and we do um, waterless composting toilets and and gray water systems and uh, complete nutrient cycling, so that there's a uh, this sort of reality that the longer that we live out here in this kind of sort of brittle high desert and and the more visitors that come to enjoy our product and uh, use our composting toilets, the more fertile the landscape is left behind. So there's a, uh, a reciprocal feedback there where uh, in, in um, reversing the trend that usually where people hang out, the landscape kind of goes into a spiral. In this case, our, uh, our food forest is filled with bird life and uh, we have incredible toads and, and lizards that uh, would not be able to, to exist in, in that small of a footprint if it weren't that we were uh, sort of providing the fertile uh, excess of our, uh, of our uh, uh, human settlement. So some of the things we do, there's our, our eggs, uh, we grow, uh, that's blue corn for grain corn and tepiary dry beans and uh, runner beans and fruits and vegetables of all sorts. Those are the young hands of one of our students uh, in the teacher's hands. So mentoring young farmers is, is easier than actually farming out here in the high desert. We, we produce a wonderful crop of, of interns every year. Um, there's a, a young student learning indigenous skills of, of uh, yucca twine um, fabric sort of uh, fiber work. And uh, this is a workshop on the right, uh, building one of our, uh, that's our bathhouse. That bottle 
feature there is the shower stall bottle window for our shower. And this is a group of 25 students that came uh, onto the land, learned from uh, skilled builders, helped with the immense physical labor of building with this material, took home their memories and left us with a beautiful Cobb shower house. So Cobb is one of the things that we're, uh, we advocate um, and uh, promote here at Quail Springs. Cobb is an old English term for a lump or a loaf. And that woman on the right there is holding a Cobb ball. And uh, it's uh, essentially the same thing that you might be familiar with in Adobe, except that when it's wet like this, instead of putting it into a form, a wooden square form that would then uh, make it into a brick that you would then dry and then stack, uh, you take the cob ball as as you see it in her hands there and actually put it right on the wall like they're working it on the left. And uh, you pretty much just are playing with mud and sculpting free form, uh, stronger actually that when walls are not straight but are more curvilinear and um, wonderful thing about it one is non-toxic, uh, unskilled labor, affordable and uh, carbon neutral. Uh, amazing building material. We uh, really, really wonderful. That's a, a, a plastering workshop there that they're putting uh, finishing plaster on this beautiful garden wall. And as you see in the upper right hand corner is uh, is a nice uh, dome house. One of the structures that we have out here. We live in some pretty cozy cob homes. Um, we worked with uh, Cal Poly civic engineers and uh, to get some of the building code for for Cobb uh, construction we built these uh there are four walls actually that you're looking at here that are um, on these concrete slabs so they're all at oops wait a second I keep hitting a button uh so this is this is an earthen wall that's one foot thick eight foot wide and eight feet tall and there are four of them and they have different, you can see in this picture, there's some rebar coming out of the top of this one up here. And that's just, they had various degree of um, reinforcement of, uh, of wire and metal, but no concrete or fixative. And then the, uh, the engineers, um, master's thesis students at Cal Poly uh, designed uh, both the, the load frame, you can see on this image on the, the, on the right, Woman up on the ladder there is adjusting that piston. That's that kind of pushes and pulls these walls with up to 50 tons of pressure. And then uh, the other scientist uh, was doing uh, the telemetry and they measured all of the deflection of this wall for every pound of pressure put against it. How much did it bend and, and, and resist? And uh, it pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled and these on these four different walls and came up with a significant bit of information that had never been derived for uh, the Cobb construction uh, before. And then uh, one of them that didn't fall apart when we when we pushed and pulled it, we uh, we built into an enormous fireplace and uh, burned about a cord of firewood against it, uh, built this wonderful contraption so that we could catch all the ashes and be safe. Um, but we had a, a four hour burn where it reached 2000 degrees on the on the flame wall side, we were measuring the temperature, you can see me there on the on the far right. I'm I, I'm measuring the temperature on the back side of that one foot thick wall and after more than four hours of burning it did not change one degree. Uh, it it uh, it stayed the same temperature as uh, as it when we lit the fire and yet the other side got to be 2000 degrees and then the exciting part of this test was we hit it with a fire hose of water under pressure and uh uh that was pretty exciting i don't know if any of you know art ludwig uh engineer designer uh in in santa barbara but he helped us with all this this uh this is citizen science here um of course we were uh unable to get a burn permit to accomplish this so the science wasn't captured in a AMTS uh, standard test, so we, in order to get that, but uh, we had to um, raise sixty-five thousand dollars through our nonprofit donations 
to send our builders to a lab in Texas where they built a very similar wall and it took uh, it, it took about six or eight months in the Texas humidity for that wall to dry. We paid rent on the dolly that that wall was drying and then we they rolled it into a kiln and blasted it in a furnace and then hit it with the fire hose and measured the uh, the very same thing for $65,000 that we did here on an afternoon uh, with the joy of it. And, and we discovered some pretty remarkable things. The longer you burn this stuff and the hotter it gets, the more resilient it becomes. Uh, like, like making a brick, right? Did, did we not know this? I'm not sure if the results are that surprising. Um, this is one of the things we do with Cobb all over the place. This is a, uh, a social portal here. If you build a pizza oven, you will have community engagement. You, <laughs> you will gather folks. And then if you, especially if you can cook some chocolate chip cookies in it. Um, we, we built one of these at the FRC and, uh, they have picnics for the, for the seniors. They have picnics for the kids and they have pizza feasts for the firemen and, uh, it's loved by all. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it is a good example. If you were in a, a horrific urban firestorm where all of the shelters that we depend on that are built on with uh, stick frame, two by fours, toxic waste and kindling um, are all going up in flames and, and you got a pizza oven in your backyard, you got yourself some safety. You climb in there and you'll, you could outlive a firestorm. And this is the kind of thing, you know, when you start talking to the builders, uh, they, they don't understand this, but if you talk to the fire marshals, they totally get it. And then now we're starting to talk to the insurance companies and they go, what? There's, there's an inexpensive product that won't burn. That's perfectly available. And, and, and we could insure it and, and it would never burn and it doesn't rot and the insects don't eat it. Well, okay, let's make, let's make this legal. And, uh, so one of the things Quail Springs is doing is trying to advocate for legalizing cob structures for all of the reasons that we're in the business that we're doing carbon and climate um it fits right in um that's our cozy cob goat shed on a cold winter's day you can see that the pyrenees are just barely outside of it on the on the eve of this nice uh uh roof line that keeps keeps the moisture off the wall and if you look carefully hidden back in there you'll see the floppy ears of of our Nubians kind of curiously looking out uh, on a snowy day. Um, one of the things we, we do is, uh, is regenerative broad scale grazing. Uh, if you're familiar with Kuyama lamb, Jack and Jenya have an operation. They're spending a lot of time in Gaviota right now, but they, they move their sheep in, into uh, the foothills, San Marcos foothills and, and some in, in the city parks in Santa Barbara. They're doing uh, fuel mitigation for the most part, but they're also doing grassland restoration. A number of uh, biological activities are stimulated by prescriptive grazing uh, if, if the overgrazing is controlled. And these are, uh, it's, it's called mob stocking, where you take a lot of goats and you put them in a electric fenced in area and you move them off of it at uh, pres prescribed uh, frequencies. And they might not come back to that spot for a year. Um, and uh, so that's it's kind of reversing the notion that the herbivore has been the problem of desertification. They actually are doing a remarkable job of restoration. Um, so another thing we're dipping our hooves into. I'm a beekeeper. Uh, I just love this picture. There's a right there front and center is one of my queens and uh, I'm an advocate of a top bar beekeeping and work with a bunch of community members out here in Kuyama, teaching natural top bar beekeeping as opposed to uh, Langstroth or uh, commercial beekeeping. Uh, and there I am on a farm day or a, a, a fall fest in, in New Kuyama. I just brought a little bit of my bee equipment, this lovely top bar with a little bit of, of comb on it. Didn't have any bees in it when I left, left my hive. I left all the bees behind, but just showing up in in the park, the bees in the area sort of found it and then came and <clears throat> I had these little honey sticks, you know, the straw straw with a little bit of honey and the kids at first like this poor guy in the red shirt is really still pretty suspicious, but these boys and girls were like, uh, what we could feed bees 
and they're holding a droplet of honey on their hand and then standing still long enough for the bees to land on their hand and drink the honey and they're doing it with a smile on their face. Uh, this, uh, we're getting into uh, some of the community outreach. Um, uh, this is from a different slideshow uh, starting to deal with the uh, groundwater issues in Kuyama. Um, uh, along with that, uh, that mural that you saw in the opening, uh, we were paid to do a number of infographics to illustrate some of the um, issues of water in Kuyama. And this one is the uh, contrivance that we call SIGMA. And if you're all familiar with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but uh, in Kuyama, it looks like, you know, the loss of rivers and streams, uh, chronic overdraft and, and the drops of over 400 feet in groundwater levels happening in this hopper over here for the last 50 years with the elevation of the groundwater plummeting in the main basin due to uh, mostly carrot growing. And so into this hopper goes uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act made up of a whole bunch of whiz and sp swirling cogs, some of which are engaged, some of which don't seem to engage with anything and aren't listened to. Um, I happen to be chairing this standing advisory committee over here, which is advising the GSA on uh, community concerns because none of these other whirling gigs have a, a, a live or work in the, in the valley. Uh, the counties are all represented by power districts a long way from Kuyama and um, the, uh, the water district itself is um, also made up of the, the two top carrot growers uh, that operate out of Bakersfield, which brings us to uh, oh, this is a little description of of, uh, of Kuyama. If you don't know where we are, uh, we're one of the 21 critically overdrafted basins in California. Um, unlike the rest of these purple areas, sorry, um, Kuyama is similar to this one way down here in Borrego Springs, which is the only other valley um, water basin, groundwater basin that has no hookups to stolen rivers from distant watersheds. Uh, Borrego Springs and Quail Springs I mean, and Kuyama Valley um, have the water that's underground and that's it. There's no pipelines, there's no borrowed water, no, no uh, you know, Kern River, or Sierra water pumped in or, or Bay Area water being pumped down the coast. Um, it's all groundwater dependent, which puts us uh, in, a, in an interesting situation, which is basically we're able to describe our chronic problem easier than the rest of the folks who have all these horrible jurisdictional overlaps of drinking water, irrigation, you know, state water, federal water, all sorts of water suppliers. Um, in, in Kuyama, it's your well and there's no other purveyor. Um, and then into this comes the uh, adjudication. I wanted to, to wrap up with this. Um, it's a significant blow to, 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 to the valley. Um, the two largest operators in the valley have sued the rest of the groundwater pumpers to adjudicate the water rights uh, forevermore. And uh, it's, it's a huge sort of David Goliath situation. Most folks can't afford to bring in a water lawyer, much less understand what it is that they have at stake with either not showing up or, or um, you know, if they're a de minimis user or, you know, it's like this is this is all about securing um, property rights based on historic use or I should say historic abuse. The reason we're an overdrafted basin is due to these two operators, and now they're claiming that if you don't show up in a court in Los Angeles, you may lose whatever water rights you think you have. Um, the, the valleys uh, recognized by DWR as disadvantaged. Uh, a couple of communities are severely disadvantaged, and, uh, and yet they all have to get their own water lawyer to secure access to uh, to safe and affordable drinking water or irrigation. And uh, with that, I will leave a couple of minutes for any questions. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, talk 
on a number of subjects there. We, we do tend to, to do a, a lot of things with a very slim budget out here. But uh, just to, to close the, uh, the advocacy for groundwater uh, and the advocacy for that uh, safe uh, Cobb natural building is uh, two of the, the major things that we're engaged with these days. Well, thank you so much, Brent. And that was, um, yeah, very informative, very interesting. I have a few friends who did like the work trade up at Quail Springs or, and I, you know, I have a friend who worked for Kiyama Lamb. And um, so it's cool to sort of see how it all fits together and learn a little bit more. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I have a comment and I, uh, that was just fascinating. I really enjoyed hearing what you had to say and seeing the pictures that helps bring it all together. Um, is there anything you're looking for from an organization like SBCAN, which is involved in um, a variety of issues we, we uh, try to help um, in environmental, economic, and social justice issues, and you're right up our alleyway. Do you need um, somebody advocating for, I don't know, to, to, are, you, are you getting the support you need to go to the court? Are you, are you well, going to- Well, the, the, the court it? issue, I wish I, I could suggest what might benefit the Valley there, and I, it's a really daunting issue. I'm. I'm, uh, like I mentioned, super engaged with the whole Sigma involvement, and we just had our sustainable groundwater management plan adopted by Department of Water Resources, and now they're already talking about changing it. Um, <clears throat> and I, I've been involved with that from the beginning, and I kind of feel like I have a little traction in there, but with this adjudication, I am just floored. Um, it's super depressing to, to think that, you know, I mean, not just the individuals uh, who have uh, to protect their water rights, but there isn't any lawyer out there speaking for the cottonwood trees or the willows or the kingfishers. And, uh, and, and the adjudication doesn't really have anything to include for the uh, other beneficial users of this groundwater. Um, but to answer your question, thanks. Um, uh, we are uh, particularly uh, engaged with, um, with Family Resource Center with Lynn and Martha, um, we're trying to execute this um, climate uh, a transformative climate communities grant that the county is writing and uh, trying to find good ways to bring it into uh, Kuyama for a lasting impact. Um, Quail Springs has got a couple of little things that it's doing, but I, I really would love to see some way to get um, assistance either for, for the adjudication, you know, but you know, lawyers don't advise for free. <laughs> um, but but the uh, the community access to drinking water, I think, is is something that um, really could use some assistance. There's um, either ways to bring in um, water testing or you know help for for uh, water sampling. And uh, a lot of that has to do with community outreach and sort of surveying and census reading for, you know, why, why are people not drinking their water and what would they, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks won't drink at all from their well and they're spending a lot of money and a lot of plastic bottled in bottling water, um, sometimes needlessly. Um, but it, yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if the Environmental Defense Center could help you and if you could get some grants um, to hire them to uh, be lawyers on your behalf. Yeah, I've I've talked with them a little bit and oh God, it's, I, think, I think the water lawyer is a particular breed of shark. I'm not sure what it takes, uh, but it's, it's like folks will say, they're land use or they're an attorney of all sorts, but then when it starts to talk about water, they go, oh, I'm not a water lawyer. <laughs> and maybe that's California, I don't know, but I haven't been able to get the EDC to, 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 take, to take bite on that hook. They say they don't have the expertise in that area or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it's sort of question whether it's an environmental issue or a private property right issue, but you know, 
Like I say, those kingfishers and cottonwood trees don't have a property right lawyer. Yeah. Um, I see LaWanda has her hand raised. And Brendan, do you mind stopping sharing screen so we oh, can yeah. see everyone? Great. Well, I just want to say that I uh, was able to visit uh, Quell Springs uh, probably about 10 years ago. Wow. As a, um, I was actually on the board of the Fund for Santa Barbara. And we came out and we had a delicious lunch with the, uh, the, all the food that you all had grown. Um, and if you've never been, you really, really need to go out and see the work uh, that they're doing and how they live from the land. And it, it's something to see. It's beautiful. So thank you for your presentation. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, the thank only, you very much. The only thing I don't like is the little goat part, but. <laughs> oh, they're adorable. <laughs> I, I know, but then they they have to uh, be eaten. Well, yeah. And I know, I know, that's just me. That's me. I hear you. So, I, yeah. I, I, I spent I spent almost 20 years as a vegetarian kind of grappling with those those issues and and uh, they're very real and it it I, I hear you there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And and on that note, I, I just posted our website. Um, uh, www.quailsprings.org. We do have um, a, usually a monthly farm tour on the second Saturday of the month. But um, we we like to give our visitors a break. Uh, so July and August, um, we're not in inviting you out. So the next one's in September when it's a little bit cooler. And uh, yeah, second Saturday of the month. And usually we meet uh, up in, in a local at the pistachio company, bring you in and, and give you uh, the tour, a bunch of these beautiful cob houses and the farm system and then a lunch and, and question and answer. So if anybody's interested, just uh, log on there and, and, and you can see our dates. We've got a couple more questions. Great. Yeah, let's do Cliff and then Sarah. I'm curious, uh, have you had any conversations with Doss Williams? Who's Absolutely. Your, who, who's your, your commissioner? And uh, I would hope maybe he could, could be, get behind your needs. Uh, both, both here, at Quail Springs, he's a big advocate for the natural building. Um, Abby, he was actually in an incredibly important meeting here when he was an assemblyman up in, in Sacramento here at Quail Springs when we met with our Ventura district. But Das is also on the GSA um, and an and a advocate for our, our, our needs in, uh, at the GSA standing up to the, um, to the agribusiness. So yes, he's Great. been instrumental. Good, good, thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, wonderful talk. I mean, you know, I'm learning everything, learning something new every day. Uh, how far is it from Santa Maria to get to Quail Springs if we wanted to come visit you? Um, from Santa Maria, it's about an hour. I think it takes about an hour to get there from here. Um, a little less to uh, get to Ojai if the road is open. Um, Oh, it's currently not open yet. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's it takes two and a half hours for us to get around to Santa Barbara now. Oh well, it's something to think about to do kind of like a like a tour of that because I'd love to be out in the natural world and and be able to see your work and even feed the bees. I'd be brave enough to feed the bees. You know, I'm not afraid of needles, so I might as well not right. be afraid of bees. The bees, really, we could feed the, what feed do the goats you think as well. Of folks? We gotta, what do you think? Baby goats. I even like baby goats, but I, I'm with all I wanna. I wouldn't want to kill them. Mm -mm. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah, it'd be great to to come visit or to set up a, a SB Can field trip someday, yeah. maybe. Oh, I, I should also just mention, um, we, we used to do an awful lot of on site um, programming and we're currently um, cutting back on that and we have a number of things online. 
So uh, you can see on that website, we have a, a natural building workshop and uh, a permaculture design workshop uh, that uh, going on. And, uh, and we have a third program that we offer in the fall, the land-based land living um, sort of online educational platform. So although we tend to be the sort of experiential learning center, um, the online platform has certainly helped us with uh, the whole COVID sort of, we're, we're an incredibly remote site. Um, as we just mentioned, it takes, it takes a full day to come out and, and visit us and, and well worth uh, coming out to spend the night. All right. Well, thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, feel free to stay on. It's um, but feel free to move on with your day if um, if you have other things to get to. Um, but I think I will turn it over to Ken now to introduce the land use alternative item. Well, thank you. And thank you, Brenton. It was great to hear your presentation. And when we met and you were talking, I was trying to visualize all what you were talking about. And now I get it more because of your visuals today. It was really nice, thank you. And now we move from a very small area. How many, how many acres? Uh, 450 is, is the land holding, uh -huh. uh, but we're like up in the national forest. So it's kind of, boundless wilderness uh we're, we're the edge of our watershed is the edge of the Chumash wilderness section of the los padres oh well, thank you so here in, in santa maria the city council soon and next week the planning commission will consider a preferred land use alternative that the consultants and uh and staff are recommending for their general plan that would uh, include about a thousand acres of annexation of prime, almost all, at least 80% prime agricultural land into the city for subdivisions and, and retail and, and other urban uses. It seems to me like a huge amount. I, and I'm looking at your pictures, Brenton, I was thinking, well, that, that's a kind of small area, but it's way beyond the pictures that you were showing us. So hundreds of acres. So here we're talking hundreds of acres, um, up to a thousand acres proposed to be annexed. There's a, a, a lot of a lot of parts to the uh, update to the general plan, which is something that cities do every 25 or 30 years. And but right now the part that they're looking at is three different land use scenarios. Shall we build within our city limits, which we advocate? Shall we annex? Uh, 1,500 or, or more acres, 1,700, I guess, was the annexation proposal. And then there's a hybrid that's what's proposed. And uh, so we're not happy with the the hybrid. We didn't like it to begin with, but then it got amended at the last minute before the Planning Commission study session last week to add uh, a couple of hundred more acres. So it's about 1,000 acres of prime almost all prime ag land suggested to be annexed. And this will be heard at the Planning Commission next week. So it's the, it's the one part of the general plan that's sort of right before us at the moment. There are a lot of other parts that have to do with transportation and circulation and other, you know, 20 other different elements of a general plan. But this is what's before them now. And I know that, uh, Alan has probably something to say, and Nadia might, and, uh, and I'm curious to hear from Pam and and uh, others. Uh, if you've if you're all up to date on this, and what do you think about it? Because I know uh, Pam and Cliff you were talking, and somebody at um, one of the CEC staff members who did a lot of analysis of it was concerned about the gentrification element or potential gentrification potential of the infill alternative and so i'm i'm all ears and sarah you had things to say too in the meeting we had just a day or two ago so anyway I'm, i'd like to hear what everybody thinks 
Well, I think um, I just want to highlight this point about like they've they've made some changes to the preferred alternative from what was proposed in the survey um, to what now they're suggesting the counts or the planning commission recommend, which is like it's still it's the hybrid version, but it's become closer to the annex option in almost every way, um, which is kind of opposite what the survey um, results were most, it was, what was it? 41% preferred the infill alternative, 40% preferred hybrid and 20% preferred annex. So um, if anything, it should be leaning towards more of the infill um, option if if we're going by the survey, um, which I guess there's maybe different things that they take into consideration. Um, and then one other thing I also thought was interesting on the document, and I, I put links to both the presentation and the document that lays this out. Um, you know, one of the biggest arguments for annexation is to um, that they don't have enough capacity to build enough housing that is what's needed. But from the city's own analysis, all three options, including the infill option, allow sufficient capacity for housing. Um, so I don't really know. Obviously, they have other justifications for, for saying they need to annex, but um, yeah, just I just thought that that was interesting by their own analysis. They don't they don't need it. They could build all the housing they need um, within the existing city limits and it would have less greenhouse gas emissions and everything like that. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. And, and thank you for that. And it probably would lead to a more walkable community. Contrary to one of the graphs that they had and maybe they've adjusted it. I'm not sure if they've adjusted it or not, but there, there was a graph that showed that the, the alternative that would have the most negative impacts on walkability was the infill. Didn't make any sense to me. And I pointed that out to city staff and I, I think they said they agreed and they're gonna fix that, but I don't know if they have. I mean, the most walkable community, urban community I've ever been in is Manhattan. It's the densest and the most walkable. I mean, you might bump into some, but no, but you don't bump into people. You walk and everybody, they just weave like this. It's walkable and everybody stops at the traffic lights and the streets aren't too wide. So I hope they've fixed that because it, it should be the most walkable alternative, the infill. I mean, a lot of this, <laughs> you know, not, not to... I, I don't know how much Pam and Cliff and others have have spent looking at this document, but to me, and Nadia has already pointed to this, like a lot of things just do not make sense. Um, you know, again, the 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 majority, not the majority, the plurality voted in favor of of basically the infill option. That's not the way that they're going. Everything that their data says implies that the infill is the option that solves like their most stated goals in terms of walkability, what they're finding from the community members themselves. Uh, I think it said 60% wanted, uh, again, more a more walkable, what was it? We lost it. 60% uh, you know, voted strongly for a high density on Broadway and Main Street. Whereas the plans that they suggested is basically filling on the east side. The, the most important outcomes that people voted, almost 40%, was better walkability and reduced traffic congestion, which I don't understand how annexing on a whole different side of Santa Maria would fix any of those. And then when you just look at their actual um, little plot here that talks about the impacts with the little dots. Um, again, 
often the hybrid plan just arbitrarily says that it's better <laughs> than the than the annexation plan and in many aspects it's not better it's just it's just getting to that version on the summary of findings i think it even says that option b the infill option would have the most air quality impacts as, as well as the most fire impacts um and and like Ken said, the 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 least impacts on ease of walkability. So these things are just I they don't make sense to me. And I really I, I think these tools are supposed to make it easier for community members to follow their reasoning. But I kind of almost want to ask, what's the reasoning behind these dots? Like it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but Let me, I'm going to share my screen to show what we're talking about. Um, and maybe that will be helpful. This is what you're talking about, right, Alan? Uh, there's the other one, I think, in the other document. I think it's page 36. Um, did I pass it? Page? Uh, yeah, right there. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But which, what are they talking about here? So, so basically this is their summary of finding, like this is the same thing that you were showing on the other one. It, it's just, Kind of comparing the oh a b c okay i see yeah supposedly the lower to easier impacts and i would really love to hear their reasoning behind some of these I, again it, it feels like c was just automatically given two dots on all of them <laughs> uh you know besides noise impacts but it yeah, I, I I really wish I knew more about the reasoning. It it just sounds like they're just saying what they want and and doing it anyway. But I know Cliff has his hand raised. Well, but I I, I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, my one particular point I wanted to make. Um, I mean, Ken talked about Manhattan about you know I lived in Boston. I went to school in Boston. Uh, I never had to drive my car because we had trans public transportation. I could go anywhere. I could go to the beach. I could go, you know, I, I, I could go to school. I could go. We had transportation. We don't have transportation. And, and Sarah, Sarah is someone who experiences this. Um, you know, it's it's really a catch-22. But but we just, you know, it, it, if we're going to have a a, a urban area that is not going to rely on on cars which is a real problem because this is california this is you know we are living in 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 the 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 uh, state that got rid of public transportation in the what 20s 30s um but but to to have an urban area work like like manhattan I mean, New York has an incredible subway system. Uh, dangerous, yes, but uh, but it is used heavily, and and I, it, for we just it, it, I really think that it's important that we somehow get people to jump on buses. Um, anyway, that's yeah. I, I but I also have to be. I, I have to admit, I need to I need to look at this more closely because this I haven't seen this this document so uh, yeah um, well they just I, put it online yesterday i think yesterday morning so after ken asked them several times to do that um and the meeting is next week so it's not yeah. surprising that people haven't had a chance to look at this yet yeah yeah so yeah the next few pages nadia i think that they might share show some um some of the changes like, yeah, I think after the findings, it shows some of the, yeah, there you go. The modification, wait. Th 
So is this what you mean, the land use changes? Yeah, you, right, yes. Just so people can start having like a sense of really what is changing. Um, and, and again, Nadia, the document that you're showing us now is uh, the is the document that you've linked in the chat. I put right? it, yeah, this is the second one that I put in the chat. Okay, thank you. Um, very much. And they're both on the Imagine Santa Maria okay, website. Great. Um, so if, if we can pause right here on this, don't move it up or down, please. Um, there's two different kinds of land use changes. There's one that's changes from how, how it was to what it would be in the hybrid. And then there's changes from the hybrid to the hybrid plus, if you will. The hybrid as it was amended at the just before the planning commission study session. And so in the um, in the upper right, so there are three things, three places that show annexation areas. Those are, there you go, thank you. And in the upper right, that one was not in the hybrid and now it's in what's recommended. And that's two or 300 acres. I wish I had the exact number, but it's it's somewhere between two and three. So it, it bumps it up from 700 and something to just below a thousand acres of annexation included in, in what's proposed. And one reason that they, they the reason that they suggested adding this at, at a late uh, time this northeasternmost portion was because there's some kind of water service was put out there some time ago. So, oh, it's cheaper to, to annex that or to service that area because somebody put a water line out there. And one thing that I, I will definitely say to at the, at the commission hearing next week is that, because I've already introduced to them at the study session, the idea that in, in Lompoc, they've been going for 20 plus years to try to annex the Bailey Avenue corridor. We've fought it and it's been denied before. It was denied a few months ago by LAFCO again. And one of the arguments that they made was, oh, there's water service out Bailey. Some Something was built out there a long time ago, the, decades ago, I guess. So somebody built something out here whenever it was. It's, I, to me, it's not a good reason to add something for annexation. Somebody shouldn't have necessarily built some water line to a place that wasn't even in a sphere of influence, wasn't annexed, wasn't really planned for development. It's speculative. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know what, what this is? Well, we keep trying. Maybe if anybody here knows, it'd be Jeannie. You see, Jeannie, what, what Nadia is pointing out? That's funny because I was just looking at that and trying well, to figure out what it was. Um, well, so, so Cliff I and I tell, know. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I can tell you one thing that it is. It's where the creek that goes through our neighborhood, you know, from our lake and down that county drainage canal, that all ends there. It doesn't go into Solomon Creek. It goes there. I yeah, just, that, you know what it is? Yeah, that so that's that area, Jeannie and Ken, that we were talking about recently by you. Um, uh, Cliff and I went out there because we saw this on a map and it's you know, pretty much a private road with very expensive houses. Huh. And, uh, right yeah. and in so the middle. Our creeks go down there. And so, so maybe they're capturing, that's where the water gets captured. And that's how our friend Eric, well, <laughs> when we were out there and visited him and he was out there watering his Yeah, I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if that, that is that property, because I don't see the, the roads that connect to it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's that property and it is they're like i think they're are they 10 acres and they they have a view of the valley yeah and he had a lot of water he was out there spraying water all over his ground running around barefoot i remember it was kind of comical but uh a nice guy anyway there's a bunch mm -hmm. of people that live on 10 acres each and so i think our our creek here and there's a couple other creeks drain to there and but why is that a city thing because he Eric doesn't live on city land. So you, you know, it's there... the same as across the street from us. So on Fox and Wood Lane, um just south of Union Valley Parkway, and the eastern boundary is 135. You know, there's a condo complex that's city land. Just a little little finger. 
Mm -hmm. They like to be on the, in the city because it's easier to get approval. Well, I think we should go to Sarah and Lawanda. Sarah's had her hand up for quite a while, and then Lawanda. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Alan. Here's here's my question: the potential annexation up in the right hand corner that looks like you know that one. Oh, just point point the one the one. I wish I could make make my cursor do that. It's up, it's up, you know, where the, you know. Is this, is that, that what one. you're talking about, Sarah? Yeah, where okay. is that? That's, um, that's out there east of Pioneer Valley High School and Marion Medical Center. Okay, all and right. Down, right all up right. against the, right up against the river levee and the southern boundary of that is uh, Maine. Main Street. Okay, so that's been kind of in the plans for a while. Well, the one, if you'll move the cursor, please, down just a little bit to, down and over that one. That one's been in the plans for a while, for <laughs> sure. It, it's not in the sphere of influence or anything like that. Yeah. But it, if you drive out Main Street and you get to this point, there's curb cuts, sidewalks, curb cuts, and everything. Yeah, I know. It turns right in, and you've walked out there, so you've seen it. Anybody's driven by there, you can see it. Yeah. So it's just totally been planned, but it's not in the sphere. It's not annexed. It's it, illegitimate that that, that kind of, in my view, that that kind of uh, sidewalk sorry. and curb gonna, cut I'm, should have been put in. I'm going to jump in because that sure looks, I'm looking at a, a, a map of of Santa Maria, that sure looks like the air, the block right on the other side of Dignity Health. Yeah, that is. Yes, it, it is. It, it, that's that where that where your cursor. That's that's the block. That's the parking lot, right across from Dignity Health, and then the air. The and then oh. there's uh, it, Panther Drive. Um, but the, but the, I'm sorry, uh, Cliff. The the cursor is on a block of strawberries that's across the street from um, Hancock um, Terrace, is it called? Hancock. I'm sorry. You're you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. That's all. It's a pure strawberry field. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah you're right. I'm sorry. And the, then Take there's that thing that looks like California. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, as, but I wanted to tell you about my experience about transportation. I've been taking for two days for maybe not today going to Santa Barbara, but for two days on Monday and Tuesday, I took the bus to do transportation. For a senior, it's not bad for a dollar fifty for a day pass. But we need to get people to start using the the transportation because we don't have a whole lot of ridership. And if we if we really work together to get that to be walkable and rideable i think we could i think we could really be impressive yeah thanks sarah um we have lawanda then alan and then steph okay thank you and let me know if i should stop sharing screen or go to a different part or anything well i um i'm not sure that that anyone besides me is aware. I live on the northeast side of town. Right. Um, Merrill Gardens is, at, is actually across from me. And at one time, I've been there since 89, and at one time that was the riding stables. But now it's Merrill Gardens, and then you keep going east, and there's uh, Station 5, which is the fire station. And if you keep going east, there is uh, Pioneer Valley High School. Anyway, in the uh, the last, I would say, four or five weeks, there are these Patri Pacific Petroleum trucks, tankers, and they pull up on the side of, uh, it's on the street, but it's, a little bit ways down from the uh, the fire station, station number five, and they hook up a hose to uh, a hydrant, and they fill the tankers full of water. That's you five, know what I mean? 
Yeah, five, know, five to eight thousand gallons of water goes into one of those tankers. Oh, and boy, they were really going yesterday and today. You know about that, Ken? Well, I, I've seen them there, and I've I'm not sure what they're doing, but I think they might be hauling. That they're either hauling water to to um, to pump wastewater back into the oil fields, or they're hauling water out to where they put it into smaller trucks that then spray the roadways. That's no, I, I asked one of the guys and he says that they actually, so they haul the water and they have uh, farms and residences where they're not uh, hooked up to water and they have like, I guess you would call it like the water in Mississippi, it was like the water stations or whatever. Oh. And so they fill those, but I, I think it's really interesting. It's a lot of activity since we got all the rain. Before that, there was no activity. Hmm. And so if, yeah, it'd be really interesting to know where is that water going and can I turn on our sprinklers again full blast and make our brown grass turn green? Because we it's have so much water that they can haul that. It's all, yeah, it's off Sway Creek. Uh-huh. And before the levee there. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's a, there are a lot of, um, is it Cal Portland, the blue construction trucks? Yeah, Cal Portland. Yeah, yeah white, going, white and blue. Yeah, they're going back and forth towards Pioneer High School. Anyway. You need a lot of water to make the concrete. And Cal Portland, that they're all, a lot about concrete and construction. But it's Pacific Petroleum. I know, I, I know. And another company called Midland. Mm -hmm. Midland. I'll try to see if I can get more information. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe it's a good topic for next time, Lawanda. Yeah. See if there's someone maybe at the city who knows more about that. Um, well, they obviously but, authorize it because uh, the uh, the hydrant is chained and you have to have a key to unchain it from the lock. Mm -hmm. So, Steph. Yeah. Um, so, this refers back to a different slide, but the, the slice uh, in the annexation um, consideration that is that had that water uh you know the the water was a part of it does anybody know who owns that land and what water company is engaged in pumping and providing that water i think we meant to buy it it's like 41 or two keep going oh, this one stop. stop right there so the you know, the one almost in the middle where it says plan annexation along north and east. Who owns that land and who operates the water operation? Anybody know? Um, I don't know. There, there's who owns it. There, it's all actively farmed every day. And I don't know if it's all one parcel. Probably not, but I don't know. Well, um, if it's under the plan annexation, in my mind, um, whoever owns it is interested in developing it. So it's not an issue of, you know, agriculture uses generally more water than residential use. Um, but if the water company is currently serving agriculture, that's an interesting, you know, whoever owns that land has the rights to the water underneath it, unless it's hooked up to the city system. Mm -hmm. I, I think I know who owns that strawberry field. Rosemary Farms. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, and that's because they're, they're the rosemary berries and the rosemary farms, that's their, their line. That's part of Marion mm -hmm. Hancock Enterprises. Uh -huh. But they might, sometimes farms lease land yeah. from <laughs> other owners. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that I mean, that'd be a good question to maybe the city would know. I mean, it'd be a good thing to bring up at the planning commission meeting either way, for sure. Yeah, um, it, it just boils down to reduction of prime 
ag land within the community. Is there a right to is there a right to farm ordinance in the city? Probably not. I haven't heard of that before. The city uh, of Rio Grande passed that well over a decade ago. So there's still actually some farmland within the city, but I can't imagine that being brought up by any <laughs> any elected official in the city yeah. of San Bruno. I've never heard of that here. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, did you have you? I know you had your hand up before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I definitely have some questions for 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 most of you. I I know we're kind of running on our last ten minutes, but definitely my first question to all of you would be in terms of next week that that you know that is when the city council is voting on this. The planning and commission. The the planning commission. Sorry, and so. We will be wanting to do public comment. Um, and so my question to all of you would be, what what should that public comment include? What what is our stance? What are our points? We haven't really had the time or opportunity to to really be specific and be detail oriented on this one, like we were with housing. Um, and so I, that's why I want to make sure I, I get people's input before I I make a one pager. Basically, this one pager will be shared next week. Um, a few folks will be reviewing it, like Nadia and a few others. Um, and so we want to be sharing it. Uh, Ken, do you have like we we have we have the information? I think it's on one of the slides. The information for the actual event. Yeah, let me see. Um, I think it was like did i pass it already i think it was where you were yeah i think it's like around that 40 page i think it's 6 30 on wednesday night yeah 6 30 on wednesday yeah. i don't know where it's city uh, hall it's gonna okay. be in city hall but basically we are hoping to coordinate folks you know next week we are hoping to send out a reminder you know giving you that information of exactly when you know what the ask is what you know, a, some talking points could be or what our position would be. So that's my question to all of you. It would be, what do you think? I did want to make one final point. And, uh, you know, this is going back to that page 51 is, uh, uh, again, just the actual data uh, in, in, and the summary of what they are sharing. So in terms on page 51, you know, in terms of the greenfield land use consumed. The the infill plan um, consumes the, the the least amount of acres. Uh, that is something that we would like. We do not want to have an increase or an overabundance use of greenfield land, quote unquote. Um, the annexation plan and the hybrid plan both are more. Comparing the GHC emissions. Uh, compared to what the city is currently at, at our base. Uh, alternative B, the infill, is the only alternative that, that actually has a GHG emissions reduction. Uh, both annex and even the hybrid both include an increase in those emissions. Um, and if you go down, to, I think, to page 54, Nadia, you know, Nadia pointed this out earlier with housing um, that all alternatives would actually do sufficient housing. And actually, the alternative B, the infill, would, would actually be providing more yeah. housing than even the annexation uh, that is included in this. So if housing is our number one concern, alternative B is the solution on the alternative that will provide the most housing. Uh, if you look, you know, at the final, final slide here, Nadia, there is one difference that I noticed between the alternatives, and it's not on the expense expenditures. So each alternative is roughly going to cost the same. The number one difference that mm -hmm. it, it tells us about picking annexation is that it's going to give more revenue. So if you want to be providing more revenue for the city and just a bigger financial incentive. Annexation, that is the number one goal that that's solving. For me, I think 
the alternative B infill is the one that's actually solving the issues that the survey and the city's analysis has actually done and stated. So for me, and, and this is something that the city has reminded us at the monthly meetings, is that the hybrid option, the hybrid alternative, and this is something that I, I was kind of disheartened when I heard so much conversation on the annexation, we don't have to vote for that one, <laughs> right? We, you know, we can vote for the infill option. What we heard from people like Farah was that even the infill is not the best. It's a compromised choice. It's not the best infill plan that we can make, but it is definitely the, the only one that actually solves the issues that community members are talking about. Probably. And we are not required to choose the hybrid option, especially now, you know, with, within us, we have reasons of why we wouldn't, why we shouldn't. And it's the fact that it's going towards the alternative A. So yeah. for that reason, you know, I would advocate that what we advocate is actually to vote for alternative B um, and to develop that plan and reject the hybrid option and the other and the addendum to it, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that was a lot of time. Sorry. <laughs> I want to. No, I appreciate that. And I, I agree. And I think like just hearing what you said and looking more at this just now, like the main arguments is like, are, do you care about housing? Do you care about the environment? Like both of those things, alternative B is the best. And even if you care about the general fund, B is still better than C. <laughs> so I don't, I actually don't understand at all why they're talking about alternative C. And if if they're dead set on annexation, like they, you know, all, adopting alternative B doesn't prevent them from pursuing annexation in the future, should it become necessary or whatever. Um, but it is going to be very difficult because, you know, organizations like SB Can are going to oppose that. And the farmers and the community is going to come out and not be in support of that. So it kind of makes more sense to go with B for all the reasons you just said. Um, yeah. Well said. Um, I'd like to uh, invite Dennis Allen into this conversation. He came in late, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I want to give you an opportunity if you'd like to say anything or introduce yourself, and thank you for coming. Well, I'm just trying to uh, start engaging myself and hearing what's going on. I, I really wanted to hear about uh, Quail Springs, but I was tied up, so I didn't get come in until the last minute here. We recorded it, so you'll be able to see it on oh, our uh, on our YouTube channel. I'll make sure That's you get great. the link. Dennis, look at that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you recognize that? I do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's that's uh this is Ken Huff speaking and I I got I got that at one of the one of the fundraisers. Thank you for donating it and I'm, I'm I love it. You're so welcome. It's, it's right there in front of my face at my laptop. I I enjoy doing it. Thanks. Well, maybe you can contribute to this conversation, Dennis. Even though it wasn't the topic you signed on for, but you're a, a very uh, conscientious developer. Um, is there anything that I shouldn't say? To, I don't know. If, do we call you a developer? I know you do some development. It's a contractor. Contractor, yeah. So do you have any uh, input for us on this? Well, I haven't really tuned in long enough or, or, or know even what the details on the alternatives are. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging problem to uh, move us forward on getting more housing because that's needed, and especially affordable housing. Uh, at the same time, taking into account uh, the environment and a, a lot of it needs to really be infill projects. And, you know, I've, I've been a fan of of density for quite a while, but with uh, really a, uh, creative design, you know, good design, because without that, it can be pretty overwhelming. And that may be more general than what your specific conversation was about but uh, well we appreciate you being here well nice joining you 
Cliff, you want to wrap it up with one final? Thought? I just want to make a comment. A I, I, I thank Alan for what he just said. Um, I will spend some time looking at this this document, but um, what you just said makes a lot of sense. So thank you and thank you, Nadia, for the, the time that you've spent on this. Well, great. There's we may be having another meeting specifically on this topic on Monday or Tuesday, I think. Um, so we'll be sure to send that out to you all if you're interested. Um, and I mean, we could ask right now what day would be best. I mean, we could confirm right now with you folks if Monday or Tuesday works better. Um, I can work to make sure that the one pager is ready. Um, so maybe Tuesday, but um, we, we could also do just Monday in the evening if that works for folks. But. I'll be there, <laughs> but I just don't don't know who else would like to to have another um, time to check in. Um, if not, I can also just send um, like a poll tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday. I, I I keep thinking today's Friday, but I could coordinate that tomorrow if if folks aren't ready to decide. Maybe that's a good idea. Then we can include um, some other people who aren't here um like erica and sulema that would be good um but yeah thank you all so much for your time um put the 6 30 meeting next week in your calendar if you're able to make it um for yeah. the planning commission in santa maria and you can uh join on zoom as well um and, and we will send out information uh, we'll send a blast to everybody, mm -hmm. which will include how to write a letter if you can't come to the meeting, still putting a letter into the planning commission. If you could get that to me so I could put it into the listserv. Yeah. They haven't posted it yet. They're going to post it tomorrow. Um, so, yeah. So I, yeah. I know, we're, there. I know we're at the end of our time, but we usually ask if there's any announcements anybody needs to make. I mean, wants to make, but needs to at this point, since uh, is anything going on, you just uh, got to tell us it's urgent where we sign off. Okay, I just wanted to throw that in there. Throw a monkey wrench and thing. Thank you. <laughs> Don't yeah. forget to save your chat. Save your chat. Save your chat. We'll post this. Uh, oh, there's the posting or the recording of the North County Awards Center is up on our YouTube channel now. <laughs> if anyone wants to watch that, I have it's been processing like all day on my computer so <laughs> I haven't even looked at it actually but you can you can find it online um and maybe we'll send that out too if the quality is good <laughs> that's well, it thank you, Nadia. Thank thank you, Ken. Ken. yeah thank you all but for you all the work you do on this really yeah thank you yeah well, thank it's you. great thank you Ken was I chippy not today you were chippy yesterday and I loved it well, I'm a little tired today, so I'm okay. I was, I was a little out of line. Well, something I said, and so you chipped at me, and that was good. I appreciate it. What walking, un be? walking under the freeway. There's places where it's safe. <laughs> yeah, it is. Better Avia, I don't know. I, in Better Avia, we don't have an under the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. The, under, the underpasses are cool. <laughs> as I long as you, as there. long as you know that you don't do it at night. Don't, not at night. So uh, All right. I, was, I was asking you, is that the uh, video that? Yeah. Was, uh, Steven, Take care. I, See you I soon. need to post those Bye, photos. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Carlos was asking about the photos. Um, yeah, I, I got so them. We get to send those out. Yeah, I've got those. I need to put them online.